All right, turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 9. I want to tell you a short uh, anecdote about something that Myra and I are doing, and I hope that it's a good introduction to what I'm about to tell you. So here is the anecdote. Uh, Myra and I have been on a quest over the last few years to eat healthily. Um, we, we win some, we lose some, uh, we, we don't do great. I was down to a fit 192 pounds in October, I changed what I wanted to eat for October, November, December, and January, and now I'm a not so fit but very fluffy 210 pounds. All right, so 18 pounds in four months. And the reason why that happens is because I made bad choices. Actually, I didn't make bad choices. I made a lot of good choices <laughs> over and over and over again. So uh, we, we've been battling this. And what we decided to do, uh, she wanted to do it before me. And then I said, I'll do it with you, is we went and enrolled in Weight Watchers. So if you know anything about Weight Watchers, you know that mainly it just assigns points to different foods. You have a budget for every day, and that budget, uh, you, you just eat until your points are out, and then you don't eat anymore. Uh, there's a little grace points, they call weekly points, and so we're trying to learn our way around this. Uh, but what it means is that every food that we eat is a choice. And it's always a trade-off. You can, if you want something that's really, really yummy and really, really fattening, you're going to get points. If you want something that has no points, it's going to taste like it has no points. And so it, it's this constant trade-off of eating well and, and making sure that you balance things out. And so this has been on our minds for about 10 days or two weeks now this idea of trade-off. And today, when we talk about the cost of discipleship, that's what we're talking about. You've often heard that uh, salvation is a free gift. And in a sense, it is. It's free because we didn't pay for it. Jesus paid for it. His death on the cross, his burial, his resurrection secured our salvation. Uh, and so that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So in that sense, it is free to us. We don't do anything to earn it or deserve it. We can't do anything to gain it. It's a gift. However, if you think of it in the way of a trade-off, there is a cost involved. And in fact, that's exactly what we're going to see, starting in verse number 23 of Luke chapter 9. Uh, this is Jesus continuing his teaching on discipleship. And I just want to read four verses to you, 23 to 26. God's word says this. And he was saying to them all, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. For what is a man profited if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory, and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. So this is the Lord's word for us tonight. This is a, a short passage. Don't worry about the context because the context is Jesus' teaching. Uh, this is a part in Luke where he is, he is going from thing to thing, um, not necessarily in, uh, in chro chronological order, but in thematic order. So right before this, thematically, he asks Peter, who do people say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ. And then after this passage of Scripture, we go to the transfiguration, and he goes up onto the mountaintop. So it's, it's thematic about who Jesus is and how we're to follow him. It's not necessarily chronological in this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened. So with that in mind, I want to show us this idea of the cost of discipleship. What we've been talking about through all these weeks is the essence of discipleship. What does it mean to be a disciple? Uh, all the different, I've tried to take it and like a, a fine gem, just turn it around, not gem, G-E-M, and, uh, and turn it around and show you the different facets of what discipleship looks like. And so what we did is we decided, uh, I asked this from the very first week, what is discipleship 
or what does it mean to be discipled? So how do you know that you're a disciple? What does it look like for us? And especially as a church, what are we trying to produce if we're going to make disciples? Jesus told us to go and make disciples of all the nations. What does that look like? You have to know what a disciple looks like in order to make one. You have to know if you're if you're being successful, you know how you have to know if you're if you're churning out the right looking thing or the right thing that Jesus called us to do. And so if you'll remember, I, I defined it this way. A disciple is a fully orbed follower of Christ, connecting for worship and mission as members of a new race that belong to God's new and everlasting kingdom. I did this on purpose. I, I wrote it in such a way that it would touch every facet or every role that a Christ follower would have. So connecting for worship and mission is being a part of the church. So in some ways, a disciple is a church member, somebody who's involved in the life of a church. But then also notice that our new birth in Jesus allows us to be a part of a new race. Uh, we are no longer in Adam. We've died to that. And we are now in Christ. And so Jesus has constituted a new race. His resurrection from the dead began that. He is the firstborn of the resurrection. Although temporally, time-wise, there were people part of this race before him. Uh, but that's just because they were trusting in the promise to come. And so Jesus started this new race with his own resurrection from the dead. And we all will belong to that. And we are working towards the population of that new kingdom, uh, population of that new race, until Jesus returns and ushers it in in its fullness. And that new race with this new group of people, all of them disciples, will live forever in the new heavens and the new earth. This is what Jesus came to do. Uh, I, I told you from the very beginning that we often view Scripture in different ways. We talk about the Old Testament saints, and we talk about the disciples, and then we talk about church members. And what I want you to see is that all of them are the same people. They are, they are followers of Jesus. There aren't differences in those. That, uh, so the things that talk about disciples, they fit us. And the things that talk about church members, they fit us. And the things that talk about people on mission, they fit us. All of this is who we are in Christ. This is the New Testament teaching on his people. So with that in mind, today I want to talk about the cost of discipleship. It's a very simple outline. I'm just taking these four verses, 23, 24, 25, 26, and I'm breaking them out. So the first thing that I want you to see in verse 23 is that there is one decision. Somebody tell me, somebody read 23 and tell me what the decision is. That's right. So the decision is this. Do you want to follow Jesus or not? That's the decision. If anyone wants to come after me, there is nobody ever in the existence of humanity that has been saved by the grace of God who did not want to come after Jesus. Those don't, they, they, are, they, they can't occur. You can't have somebody that's saved who doesn't want to follow Jesus because the only way that a person is saved is by following Jesus, is by trusting in Jesus. This is something that we have lost in the New Testament church. We talk about salvation as a free gift, and we kind of say, we don't, we don't really say this, but we kind of imply to people, all you have to do is believe that Jesus is the Son of God and, that believe, and, and believe that Jesus died for you, and you'll be saved, and then you can go live however you want to live, or you can be whoever you want to be. And the Bible does not allow us that. He calls us to follow him. Saving faith. Because let me just ask you this question. Do you think that the demons believe that Jesus is the son of God? Do you think that, Jesus, that the demons believe that Jesus died for the sins of the world? Do you think that the demons believe that Jesus rose again from the dead? Is there going to be one demon in heaven? No. No. The call is to put their faith in Jesus as Lord and Savior. It's why when I quote during the invitation, the, the, the verse that I quote most when I tell people to repent and believe is the one that says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, 
Well, that means that you're saying your hope, your trust, your allegiance, your life is given over to him. Jesus is my Lord. And believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. You will be saved. That's the, that's the call because that's really, a, it's not just, hey, you got a, you're in a bad patch of your life and you want to go to heaven when you die. And so Jesus is the answer to all your needs. That's not the gospel. The gospel is repent and believe. Put your faith in Jesus. Turn away from trying to live your own life and put your faith in his. Now, I want you to know I am not adding to salvation. I'm telling you what the Bible says about New Testament salvation. It calls us to faith in Jesus Christ as the only Lord and Savior. If you go into the book of Revelation, which I'm not going to do, and you were to look at those churches and see the, the situation that they were in, they were in a situation to compromise the lordship of Jesus. It wasn't compromising who Jesus was, and it wasn't compromising what they believed about him rising from the dead. It was compromising that they could have another Lord besides Jesus. And there is no other Lord besides Jesus, which means he is, uh, we, we decide, like he says right here, this one decision to follow Jesus. We must decide if anyone wishes to come after me. I love the beginning of the book of John, John chapter 1. And if you'll remember, uh, a couple of John the baptizer's disciples came up to Jesus, and they said, after John says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, and they said, hey, we want to see. And he says, come and come after me. Come and see. Come and see. And so they all went. They hung out with him uh, for a little bit. And I know it's hard for us to think of us, you know, hanging out with Jesus, but that's what they did. They hung out with him. They just they saw how he ate. They saw how he worked. They saw how he witnessed. They saw, they saw all those things, and then they began to follow him. And they, it, it took time for them to rec recognize who he really was, even though he told them very clearly several times. And so the call for us, and, and by the way, I'm not trying to um, take away from your salvation experience at all. That's not what I'm doing. I'm saying now that you have trusted Christ for your salvation, follow him. Walk after him. If, if you've heard anything I've said so far and you're like, well, when I trusted Christ, I just, I just didn't want to go to hell. Well, that's awesome. Jesus will save you from hell. Now follow him. Go after him. That's the call. Just now, now become like he is. Walk with him. He gives us the Holy Spirit into our life to want to be like him, to want to please him, and to have the ability to do that. Not in ourselves, but in the Holy Spirit. He begins changing us from on the inside out. I absolutely believe that if you put your faith in Jesus, he'll take care of cleaning you up. He'll take care of it. I don't have to, I don't have to preach a be good sermon once a month so that God's people will be good. I believe all I have to do is tell you what Jesus has promised in his word, who he is, exalt him in his beauty and trust that the Holy Spirit is going to call those who belong, who, who belong to him to follow him in that beauty, in that glorious magnificence that is Jesus. The Holy Spirit does that. We just decide to follow. Number one, one decision. Number two, this is the rest of that verse, two costs, two costs are involved. This is really the heart of this teaching of the Lord Jesus. He says, if anyone wishes to come after me, well, by him saying that, we decide, I want to come after him. I want to follow Jesus. That's the decision. And then he tells us the cost for that, self-denial and daily death. He says it right there. He must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Here's a question for all you scholars, Christ followers. Here's the question. What does it mean to deny yourself? Not do what you want to do. That's right. Somebody else. That may be the only answer. Not do what you want to do. Yeah, so not do what, God, what you want to do, do what God wants you to do, absolutely. I believe that this is the same as repentance. 
I believe, not, not necessarily exactly the same word or anything like that. I mean, but it's the same effect. You are, so when you repent, you are turning away from doing things your own way, doing things for yourself, trying to earn heaven on your own, sinning because that's what you want to do. Any of those things that you do because you want to do it, you turn away and you put your faith in Jesus. You turn towards God. So that's what Claudette and Brad just said, the two pieces of that. You, you don't do what you want to do, and you choose to do what God wants you to do. That's the picture of repentance, turning away from self and turning toward God. In fact, in Acts chapter 20, Paul defines repentance. He says repentance toward God. And so it's the idea of turning away from self and turning toward God, uh, looking, l putting things in that order. What does it mean to deny yourself? I'm, I'm, she just said a really good way. You don't do what you want to do. But what does that mean in our daily life? You must give up your own way. That's a good, that's a good uh, uh, reference. You must give up your own way. What does it mean to give up your own way? What, what is our own way? I heard selfishness, I heard sin, I heard flesh, I think, in the, in the back. I, that is all true. Every one of those is right. But it's easy for us to say we're going to deny ourselves and we're going to give up our sin. But it also means that we have to give up our preferences. It means that we have to give up our druthers. You all know what druthers are, right? I'd rather, <laughs> it's, it's something that we would rather do. I, I see our guy from Pennsylvania doesn't know what a druther is. Uh, <clears throat> no, so uh, that in the South, we, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> the, the, uh, it, it's, what it means is that we don't even have the right to set our own goals in our life. Right? Do you understand what I mean? I mean, it means that you don't get to choose God does. You deny yourself. That means you deny yourself in every way. One of the hardest things about being on a diet is denying myself. I'll tell you what I've got a hankering for, right? And, and this is my weakness. It hasn't always been my weakness. Five years ago, six years ago when I came and joined this church, cereal was my weakness. Like I thought I was doing really good with, um, with uh, Raisin Bran Crunch but it has more sugar than, than Cinnamon Toast Crunch. It really does. More added sugar in, in uh, Raisin Bran Crunch than in the other. And, but I thought I was being healthy, and so I packed on lots and lots of pounds. So in order to get those pounds off, I had to deny myself the Raisin Bran Crunch. Right now, my hankering is something. Y'all may not like this. This may be the worst thing ever for you, but I like a piece of white bread with a lot of butter and honey. No, I don't even care. I don't, I'll fold that puppy in half so the honey doesn't leak everywhere. And I'll eat it in two bites. I love that stuff. But if I am going to be in shape, and I'm going to live to be your pastor for another 15 or 20 years, if I'm going to be able to go out and do the things that I want to do with my, with my body and my life, then I have to deny myself honey nut Cheerios, honey, butter, and bread, the great big steak at Longhorn. I mean, I, ha I just have to learn to eat different. I have to deny myself if I, because of that cause. So that's what Jesus is saying. You have, if you're going to follow Jesus, you can't follow yourself. You can't follow the world. Jesus is swimming upstream. He's going completely the opposite direction, and he's calling us to go in that direction too. You can't follow the world and follow Jesus. He said it this way in the Sermon on the Mount. You can't serve God and money. You, a man can't have two masters. Jesus, this is the same thing. You have to deny yourself. Deny himself. And then he says, and take up his cross daily and follow me. Now, I've heard a lot of people say, you know, I've got this sickness. That's just my cross to bear. I've got this other thing that's just my cross to bear. I've got my wife. She's my cross to bear. No, I mean, those kinds of things. When you, you hear people say that kind of stuff. That's not what this means. It doesn't mean that there's some kind of a burden in your life. What it means is that you have chosen to die 
to yourself every day and live to Jesus. It is the way to live the Spirit-filled life. Just to put it in Pauline terms, the Spirit-filled life means you, you have died to your way of life, and now the Holy Spirit of God is living His life, Christ's life, through you. That's the same thing. You choose every day, and sometimes more than once a day, you choose to die to yourself. This is absolutely death. It would be the same as if today we would say, he, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his electric chair daily and follow me. Or take up his gas chamber daily and follow me. That's the call on our life, to die. to our, So it's not just self-denial, it's also count yourself dead. Paul said it this way, I have been crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives through me. That's, that's, this, that, that's this life that we're supposed to live, is Christ's life through us, and us dead. Dead to our own desires, dead to our own flesh, dead to our own, all of those things. This is the cost of discipleship. I'm going to say it a different way, and it's going to sound even stronger than I've said it. I told you it was an easy sermon. It's a hard lesson to learn, to live. And that's this. You can't be a disciple of Jesus if you don't deny yourself and pick up your cross and follow him. That's what he's saying. If anybody wants to be, you must deny yourself and take up your cross daily and follow me. You can't do it any other way. Now you say, Pastor, this is, this is hard. And it is. But remember, Jesus has paid the price. He's given you his spirit who will accomplish this in you if you just decide to come after me. That's the decision. Come after me. And then seek with your life to come after him. He will work those things out in your life. He will give you the, the inclination to die to yourself. He will give you the desires to follow him and to deny yourself. He does that through us. What we do is decide and yield ourselves to the Holy Spirit. Choose to die. If you choose to die, the Holy Spirit will, will kill you. <laughs> He'll kill you. I remember we were, uh, I was at my last church preaching, and uh, we, in that church, we had several uh, evangelists who were members of the church but did evangelist-type ministry when they were away. They, they, they went and traveled. They were traveling evangelists, but they were members of our church. And I called on one of them. We were at a, a revival meeting, and uh, the, the pastor that preceded me there, his name was Brother Bob, had come back, and I'd asked him to preach a, a week of revival meetings at our church. And so he came back to preach that, and, uh, and, and so I, I called on this evangelist. I won't tell you his name, but uh, uh, he understood this. And he came up and came up to the front and grabbed the microphone. And I asked him to pray for the, and Brother Bob was going to get up and preach right after that. Grabs the microphone, says, y'all bow with me. And he says, he says Lord, please give, please give Brother Bob the grace to die. <laughs> and what he meant was die to himself. But he said, give him the grace to die. And then he prayed the rest of the prayer and, and then walked off. And Brother Bob comes up and Brother Bob says, Lord, Give me the grace to die, but not tonight. <laughs> so, so that, but that's the call, this call to die. Um, there's one more picture that I want to give you before we, before we go in a little further in this. And that picture is the picture of our very first Baptist, American Baptist uh, missionaries. Uh, uh, anybody know their names and any of their names? There's, there's a, a few that you could call out. Miss... Uh, Miss Martha, do you know a name of any of our first missionaries? Rice. Yeah, Luther Rice. Luther Rice was one. Bertha, Bertha, Smith. Bertha Smith. She was in the 20th century, but. That's right. Is anybody? And yeah, that's right. Luther Rice was too uh, in, in Georgia and South Carolina and those places. Anybody know our first, uh, our first one that we sent overseas? No, ma'am. Uh, he was from England. He, he was, he was an English Baptist. Uh, his name was Adoniram Judson. 
Adoniram Judson. Now, there was one more that went before him, but he didn't go, he didn't go around the world. Uh, he went to the Caribbean islands. Actually, the first Southern Baptist missionary was an African-American freed slave by the name of George Lyle, L-I-E-L-E. -E. And he went from Charleston, I believe, either Charleston or or Virginia area, but I think it was Charleston, and he went to one of the Caribbean islands and planted a church there after he was freed. And so he was one of the, he, he was, it wasn't freed after the, after the uh, Civil War. He was freed by his, by his master before that, but he, he's the one, one of the first ones that went as a Southern Baptist. But Adoniram Judson, those guys, Adoniram Judson and his family and those that went after him, they didn't take suitcases. They built coffins, and they put their clothes in coffins, and they put their coffins on the boats, and they went to where they were going so that when they died doing what Jesus had called them to do, their coffin would be there. That's the picture of dying to yourself, of doing what Jesus has called you to do, dying to yourself. So one choice one decision, discipleship. Two costs, self-denial and daily death. And then Jesus gives us three illustrations. One promise, one question, and one warning. The promise, for whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. What he's saying here with this illustration is he's saying if you lose your life by picking up your cross daily and following Jesus, it will be okay. It'll be okay because the eternal life that he has promised is worth it all. Dying to yourself is not so big a deal when you see the glories of heaven, the glories of eternity, the glories of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. If anybody wants to come after me, let him come. Come after me. The second thing we see is a question. This may be the greatest question ever asked in the history of the world. He says, for what, <laughs> I, I've memorized it in the King James, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his very soul. Here it says, For what is a man profited if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? What does it matter if you're the richest man in the world? What does it matter if you're the most successful business person in Concord? What does it matter if you get the best Corvette or the best motorcycle or the best boat? What does all of that matter if you, in doing so, lose your soul? Now, the great thing about following Jesus is that often he gives us all of those other things. Well, he's never made me the richest man in the world. But he gives us all the other things added on to us by following him. But we can't have those things if we choose ourselves. We lose it all. But if we choose Jesus, we really get it all. We may not have everything on this earth, but we'll have everything for all eternity. New heavens, new earth, blessings forever, which are at the right hand of the Father. That's what we get for following Jesus. So he says, what is a man profit if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? Maybe the greatest question ever asked. Maybe the only one that rivals us is, sirs, what must we do to be saved? What must we do to be saved? That's a good question, too. And then the warning, verse number 26 for whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. What this, Jesus said it a different way um, in a different passage where he says, if anyone denies me, I will deny him before the Father. But if you confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father. That's the call. This, this decision to lay aside everything that we count as valuable in our life for the sake for the sake of Jesus 
the, uh, like three different songs just popped into my head that we used to sing different, different verses of songs that, that, that came, you know, knowing you, Jesus, knowing you, you're the best. How's that go? Myra, do you know that one? Knowing you, Jesus, knowing you, you're the one, you're the best. You're my joy, my righteousness, and I love you, Lord. That's the call. The, the glories of everything is found in following Jesus. It is costly. It is costly. It doesn't cost you anything to have salvation, but it costs you your life. It costs you your life. The Bible says this. This may be a different way to look at it. The Bible says this, that the wages of sin is death, and nobody escapes that nobody escapes that when we put our faith in jesus we die to ourself and we live to him nobody escapes that wages of sin is death so let me just wrap this up three things three ways to to uh, um, apply this to our lives and then i'll pray one the call to salvation is the call to follow jesus if you are a born again believer you need to follow jesus there's no other choice that's it. Follow Jesus. The decision to follow Jesus is a decision to die. It's, it's a sacrifice of your own desires, of your own wants, of your own needs. Some of the hardest, most difficult decisions that Myra and I have ever, ever faced is when we have something we really like and the Lord puts his finger on it and says, I want that. I want that. And Often we say first, no, you can't have that, Lord. And then we realize you can't say no and Lord in the same sentence. And so you have to say, yes, Lord, you can have it. He may not be done with that. He may still be doing that in our lives. But that's the call not just for preachers' lives. That's the call for the disciple's life, someone who follows after him. And then the decision not to follow Jesus is the decision of die twice. You see, if we, if we follow Jesus, we die to ourselves now, daily, and we follow after Jesus and we'll live forever. But if you go and read in the book of Revelation, you'll realize that those who deny him, they die the second death, which means that they will spend all eternity suffering in, a, in an existence apart from the Lord in a place called hell. And that's the second death. So our choice is really, really a simple one, but it's a costly one. And so friends, I hope that each day that you wake up will find you following after Jesus, pressing into him. He'll give you grace to do it. You just have to decide that's what you're going to do. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I pray that each one of us here today would choose to be a disciple, somebody who follows after Jesus. Lord, would you create or mold us into his image, conform us to his image even today so that we would look more and more like him. So just like he was willing to die for us, that we would be willing to die for him. And so, Lord, please do this in our lives. Find us faithfully following him. And, Lord, may we, may we extend these same illustrations, these same promises, these same warnings, these same questions to all who would say they want to follow after Jesus. So, Lord, would, would you allow us to really make disciples here at First Baptist Church Concord? May we do it for your glory. We ask it in your name. Amen.